good afternoon everyone and welcome back to the shed of endless possibilities right folks I'm going to read you a story from my book dark thoughts thoughts from an eclectic mind <clears throat> and this is called the ghost hunt of Mitchell Lades. Now some of this story is true and some of it is purely fictional and I would like the people who listen to work out what they think is true and what is false. Right, a few years ago I worked in several different paranormal investigation groups. I worked with Haunted Yorkshire, I worked with Spiritual Renaissance, I worked with UK Haunted and I worked with Haunted Yorkshire. Um, we have been on quite a few investigations prior where we were, we paid to go and largely we were let down by so many of the groups and this is why we decided to form our own. <clears throat> I mean there were some investigations which were so clearly fake it was absolutely ridiculous but once you paid your money of course the groups involved felt the need to put on a show. There was one lad in particular who, whatever investigation it was, he became possessed by only what I can describe as a very bad actor. Um, it was utter nonsense. So we decided to do the ghost hunt of Mitchell Lades, which was an old mental hospital in Dewsbury in West Yorkshire. So we booked a taxi to take us down to the grounds where the hospital stood which is now abandoned of course but the taxi driver would only take us to the Spangled Bull pub and when we asked him why he said he daren't go any further because of what he had heard about Mitchell Lades and the ghosts in that area so we got out got all his equipment and started walking down Headland Road uh, down to what is called the Lagoon which conjures up images of deck chairs and palm trees etc when in fact it's actually a sewerage works. So we eventually got down there to the gates and this is where the story begins. At the side of the gate ran a small stream which gurgled and bubbled as it passed under a small culvert into what is laughingly named the lagoon. As we peered through the gates the whole site looked quite eerie as it was shrouded in mist with the old building in the distance looking as it had in its heyday with the exception of broken windows and graffiti. From what we could see the building was surrounded by beautifully manicured gardens which were obviously still being tended to by a proud gardener. There were trees and shrubs all around without a branch or twig out of place. The eerie thing was the silence which to be honest was deafening along with the mist which seemed to emanate from the ground as it rolled over the lawns and pathways. It was like the scene from the very, very best Hammer horror films. Very gothic, as though the setting for a vampire story. We pushed open the old ornate iron gate, which creaked into life. With each push its great age, the rust which it clung to the hinges. Then we entered the grounds and as we walked up the driveway, we noticed a small building to our left which stood a good distance from the main body of the house. This building seemed to attract us 
it was something as though it was willing us to enter if we dare. Nervously we opened the door and a strange smell came from within, a smell that we had not come across before. We spoke about the smell and in the end put it down to the age of the building and the length of time it had stood empty. We then opened an inner door which led to a mortuary and standing in the centre was the old mortuary slab, so cold looking <clears throat> and the porcelain was so white as our torch torchlight shone on it. This had obviously seen many dead bodies upon it during the hospital's history. The drainage channels were very clear where all the blood of those who had passed would have been washed away and into the drain during post-mortems. Even the block where the dead person's head would be rested during that final invasion of their privacy remained intact. And the smell of death lingered. A cold shiver ran down our spines. We stood and looked and thought about what had happened in that room and what the room had witnessed over the years. As we left the post-mortem room, all of us had in our minds that we had just seen the future for everybody, as nobody gets out of this alive. And we will all end up on a similar slab at some point. We agreed to come back there after dark to do an investigation. The closer we got to the building, the more the mist seemed to roll around the foundation stones and then spread out across the lawn areas as though stretching out to reach us. Surely the building could not be unnerving as the mortuary, or could it? The mist stretched up the walls and entered into the building through the broken window panes. We arrived at the front door where someone had written, All who enter here will die. Sadly, that was true for so many of the patients who had entered those premises, never to see the light of day again. People who, due to their mental illness, were shut away from the larger society and for many years underwent many dubious treatments, including electroconvulsive therapy, the frontal lobotomies, <clears throat> etc. As we opened the door to the entrance lobby, we saw a desk and a couple of chairs. These were upturned, get upturned against a wall, and above an old Victorian-style fireplace was a portrait of Queen Victoria. It was a skew on the wall where the wallpaper and plaster were peeling away from the structure. We decided to make this our hub, so that each investigator knew where to return to, should we split up for any reason. As it was light, we decided to do our baseline test through the building, looking for any natural phenomena which could cause creaks, any broken windows which could cause cold wind blow, loose floorboards, rodents, that kind of thing. To the left of the doorway was Ward 1. We approached the door and nervously pushed it open. As we entered the room, several of the investigators said they could smell surgical spirit, which we put down to the fact that we were in an old hospital, and therefore open to suggestion from our own minds. There were several beds and trolleys which had been thrown about, an old-style wheelchair in the corner. The interior of the ward was decaying and plaster falling from the walls, which exposed bare brickwork. We began our tests in this area and through the other wards and doctors' offices and nursing areas. We all had the usual equipment such as EMF meters, um, EVP recorders, uh, temperature gauges, all that kind of thing. As we walked around we found several areas where noises were heard. <clears throat> but we put it down to loose flooring and things moving in the breeze. 
We returned to the hub and chatted about what we had experienced and whether we thought there was anything paranormal going on within the walls. The darkness came all too soon and the whole building took on a completely different persona. One of a scary old mental hospital, one of which had been the subject of many horror movies. It was time to start the investigation in earnest, but this time the lights were out. The only light we had was the torchlight and the light from our cameras. It was 21.30 hours. We made the decision to go back down the driveway to the mortuary building. As though we wanted to get this part of the investigation out of the way as quickly as possible. We were all dreading opening those doors again and we felt a real sense of fear that something would be there waiting for us. Something that had returned from behind the veil of death. Even though we were desperate to find something paranormal, something to give us knowledge that there are ghosts and that there is something beyond death. We started the cameras rolling in the entrance and slowly walked to the doors leading to the mortuary room. That room where so many post-mortems had taken place. It was pitch black in there. We started taking photographs and as we did, <clears throat> the flash from the cameras caught something on the mortuary slab. We quickly directed our torches at it and there sat on the end of the slab, resting on each side of the post-mortem headrest were two teddy bears. None of us could remember seeing them when we had been in the room earlier. The teddy bears were very careworn and obviously of great age. We were stunned and had no idea as to how they could have appeared there. The cameraman informed us that he had just seen two light anomalies passing the camera, which at the point did not mean anything to us. There is a big debate as to the true meaning of orbs. We decided to do some EVP work where a spirit is supposed to be able to communicate through the voice recorder. This again is a much debated subject. There is a school of thought who believe in something called the stone tape theory, where the fabric of the building is thought to contain memories and voices from the past. We played back the EVP recording and we had not picked up any voices but we could hear what sounded like children laughing. But it seemed to be in the distance, we couldn't quite work it out. So we put it down to extraneous noise and left it at that. We walked away from the mortuary still scratching our heads about the appearance of the two teddy bears and the vague possibility that we could have missed them the first time we entered. Once inside we entered through the double doors which led into Ward 1. There was an occasional flash of moonlight as it appeared from behind the clouds, cast an eerie glow across the ward. The cameraman told us that several light anomalies had crossed the screen of his camera. None of us as the group fully understand what orbs are known, what they are. People say they are dust. They are insects, moisture, but some are convinced that they are actually sentient energy and can be called on command. Again, this is a sketchy area to say the least. We heard a tapping noise coming from the corner of the ward, so cautiously we walked towards the source of the noise and found that it was a branch of a tree blowing against a window pane. We began to call out and ask if there were any spirit people or any mental spirits with us. And please could they make a noise or show us a sign by throwing something or touching one of us. We heard nothing and felt nothing, with the exception of a drop in temperature. We put it down to being nightfall. We walked out through the double doors at the end of the ward, which led into a stairwell to walk two. We ascended the stairs and gently pushed open the doors to the ward. 
we entered inside the ward which was very similar to Ward 1 <clears throat> and it didn't really prove or provide any evidence. We left Walk 2 and crossed the corridor which led to Walk 3. As we entered this ward there was a very noticeable drop in temperature, so much so that we fastened our coats up against the cold. As we stood there at the entrance our breath was visible which gives some indication as to how cold it really was. We took some photographs and as we looked back we could see very interesting shapes within the mist and what looked like the faces of two children. But we just put it down to pareidolia. We decided to do an Ouija session so we sat around the table, placed our fingers on the planchette and ask the spirit of the Ouija to come and help us contact any spirits within the hospital. We asked the board how many spirits were in the building. Slowly the planchette moved and spelt the word many. We were all a bit shocked and amazed that the board was actually working. We asked again how many spirits were in the room with us. The planchette moved and went to the number two. So we knew we had two spirits in the room. We asked if the spirits were male. The planchette moved to no. So we knew that the spirits were female. We asked how old the females were. The planchette moved to the numbers 10, then moved to number 11. So we had the spirits of two children who had passed away within those hospital walls. We asked the board to give us any names. The planchette slowly moved and spelt out Maggie, moved again and spelt out Charlotte. We asked the board what year they had passed away. And again the planchette moved and gave us the date of 1825. We asked the cause of death, the planchette on the Ouija board spelt out smallpox. So we set up an EVP again and took some photographs around the room but again sadly we caught nothing with the exception of once again a distant sound of laughing children. We made our way back through the wards feeling quite disappointed that we had not really witnessed anything with our own eyes. No stones have been thrown, and none of us have become possessed. Nothing on the EVP, no figures in the photographs, no full-bodied apparitions. But I have to say that as we made our way back through the wards, we all said that we had a feeling that we were being watched. We got back to the hub and sat and had a coffee, talked about the events of the night, discussed the Ouija session, and we all agreed that it was not any of us who were pushing the planchette. We checked the footage which had been filmed and all we could see were orbs floating around. And we could see that there were two orbs that were much brighter than the rest. We didn't have an answer to what they were and why they were brighter. We really thought nothing more about it. The sun was due to rise, so we decided to pack all our stuff away and leave the old building. On leaving, we closed the door and looked back at the sign which stated, All the went to here will die. We were happy to be alive. The sun was just beginning to appear over the brow of the hill. We walked down the pathway past the beautifully manicured gardens. The lawns were full of dew. Cobwebs hung from the shrubs, as though encrusted with diamonds, and everywhere around us was a beautiful silence. As we walked further down past another lawn, we noticed that someone had walked across the grass, as the imprint of their feet was still there in the dew. As we looked more closely, we saw that it was two sets of footprints, and stranger still, they were footprints of children. How could this be? It was early morning, the sun was just rising in the sky. The hospital was miles from any housing. 
We all just stood there and stared as we were looking. We heard what sounded like children laughing again. As we turned to look back up the drive leading to the hospital, there at the very top stood two young girls, both dressed in long night dresses, each holding a teddy bear. The children then waved at us before vanishing into the morning light. Finally, we had seen what we had been searching for. We vowed to return at a later date and see if we could catch sight of the spirit children again, or maybe even the other spirits which still exist in Mitchell Lades. And there we are, folks. I hope my voice hasn't bored you too much. I hope you've enjoyed what you've heard. If you have, please hit that like button. Leave a comment in the box below. Hit the bell icon for any future uploads. And above all, if you've not yet subscribed, come and join us. It won't cost you anything. Help the channel grow and we become part of that bigger community. So as always, I will say to you all, my family and friends, Namaste. Have an absolutely amazing rest of the day, folks. Bye for now.